Good afternoon, Marva, and welcome to this session to know more about you. Thank you, Swati. I really appreciate having, you, know, you having me here today. Absolutely. So I know you're doing a lot of good work in uh, ethics and artificial intelligence, and you lead a number of uh, sessions educating and spreading awareness about the importance of ethics in AI. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, with your career trajectory. You've had a very interesting career trajectory. So tell me a little bit about uh, what did you study in college? What are the types of jobs you have done in the past? And how did you come about into the field of working in the ethical implications of AI? Absolutely. Uh, I jumped around a bit. But my majors, I double majored in international relations and political science. Um, and when I came out of school, I started with a German bank doing uh, project management and procurement. Uh, that was totally uh, irrelevant. Your friend, yeah. uh, I did that for six years and towards the end of the sixth year, uh, Merrill Lynch back at the time was entering the Turkish market. Um, so they asked me to come on board and help them build the office from scratch and like build the two entities uh, in terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I moved over and a few years um, later, um, I moved over our HR director at the time, our country HR managers uh, transferred uh, over to another company and I was asked to take over HR. So I became mm -hmm. the country HR manager. Um, that was right after like months after the Merrill Lynch Bank of America uh, acquisition mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. Merrill Lynch mm -hmm. and right in the middle of the 2008, 2009 uh, crisis. Uh, so right. it was a pretty turbulent time. Um, but also what happened right after the merger was um, merging of a lot of platforms. So there was a lot of project management and technology updates, lounge, uh, you know, my, my migrations, mm -hmm. um, as well as staff changes in, mm -hmm. in all offices around the world. Um, so once we settled in a year and a half that I was in that, or two years in, I was in that job, um, company asked me to transfer over to London mm -hmm. to take on a brand new role that they had created uh, within the campus recruitment team as the diversity recruitment manager. Mm -hmm. And idea was investment, investment, bank, investment banking. I right, right. Like very much uh, looking like Silicon Valley is looking today. Mm -hmm. um, how can we um, attract people um, from, from, uh, from different gender identities, uh, from different be uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, as well as different uh, degrees? You know, not only looking at um, mathematics or economics degrees etc but how can we diversify that so i spent the next uh few years uh i'm sorry about the grandfather clock in the background uh i spent the next few years going around the top universities in uk europe middle east um just connecting with different societies in those universities connecting with the that are relevant to the diversity groups, mm -hmm. doing workshops, skills workshops, career fairs. Wow, that was, they were seems to be in the forefront of diversity inclusion a few years back, right? Yeah, this was, this was a decade ago. So this was tw uh, 2010 when I started that. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, and one of the uh, additional roles or additional responsibilities in that role was uh, being the global owner of our um, campus recruitment technology or ATS at that moment. So doing mm -hmm. all the, like annual upgrades, changes, etc. Right. Um, and then I, in time, I took over another uh, recruitment technology and I ended up doing a lot of like recruitment benchmarking across the different departments in the bank, as well as different banks in, in, mm -hmm. in, in the region. But what they all um, snowballed. I'm taking a bit of time to explain this because they en ended up uh, snowballing into this uh, one thing that really made it clear for me, like how technologies, the changes you make in technologies, the, the policies that you put in place can enhance things for people. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do it right, it is going to put serious obstacles um, in terms of 
reaching those opportunities or resources. Um, and I, I had the chance and honor of like being really close to different groups to understand what their concerns, the impact, etc. cetera. Um, so fast forward, uh, I, went to, I came to US, uh, got married in the meantime. Uh, and 20 years after I started my corporate career, I ended up pulling the plug uh, as I was like focusing more and more on AI ethics. And one of my uh, goals was, uh, giving the know-how back to a uh, nonprofit. So right. 2018, I started working uh, with a nonprofit in, in Nevada. Mm -hmm. uh, High Sierra Industries, we develop learning technologies for people with disabilities, learning systems and technologies. I took over IT, uh, HIPAA privacy and security mm -hmm. and you know technology project management as well as at that point, I had already launched my own website or platform, aiethicist.org. Mm -hmm. So it's still uh, coming together, um, definitely. And uh, I, I I feel like all my experience, corporate experience, my you know, changing countries, cultures, all that experience uh, was probably for, I don't know, meant to be, <laughs> that someone somehow it's all coming together. Absolutely. I think I think we all have that journey, whether it's planned and a lot of unplanned circumstances that help us grow our knowledge base and build the mental models that are necessary for the future things to come. So why? Why AI ethicist? Why did you start it? Uh, the platform itself came out of my frustration of when I, you, you know, years back looking, starting to understand AI ethics debates, all this like principles, guidelines, going back to uh, bias debates and coming from a diversity uh, uh, background as well. Um, I kept going down this like rabbit holes with the research papers or reports, you know, you, mm -hmm. you click on reference, you you jump onto something and jump on yeah, something tell me about where, it. where you started is very different. And mm -hmm. uh, I was having a hard time um, keeping track of all the like progression of that debate and mm -hmm. the relevant uh, debates as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I, I probably am not the only person. <laughs> I'm sure. uh, who's yeah. experiencing this so I decided to put together the website um, for really for people who are interested in coming to this field understanding mm -hmm. like what are the top debates organizations legislation um, as well as some of the top bias debates and mm -hmm. to provide some tools uh, showcase some tools uh, and toolkits uh, but also for people who are doing research I get a lot of feedback from researchers actually mm -hmm. uh, if they are particularly researching a topic that I had, you know, put together the curated content for, mm -hmm. uh, I get the feedback that it ends up being really helpful for their research. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I use that, uh, sorry, I update the websites at least uh, once or twice a month. So mm -hmm. it is a living website. Um, and then as I was doing that, you know, my, focus on my work in AI ethics has kind of uh, matured itself as well. Uh, I'm an independent consultant and trainer in AI ethics and governance. Mm -hmm. um, so like focusing on three, um, three areas. One is advocacy and awareness raising. Mm -hmm. Like like you, you know. So right, like we all spread, need to know, do more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah trying to spread the message around uh, what it is, what AI technologies and big data, what are the consequences on your personal life, social justice, uh, democracy in general, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Um, the second piece is capacity building. That's where the consultancy and training piece comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I work with both C-level, you know, C-suits, executives and, and boards, as well as uh, developer teams uh, either I uh, am embedded in the project teams or I go in and help them build the capacity within themselves, which is, you know, the, my, my preferred method, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just getting that ethical reasoning, critical thinking, ethical reasoning, and understanding the different sides of ethics and mm -hmm. trying to help them uh, 
uh, get it to a second nature. Right, yes. right. Uh, and then the third piece is around governance. So I uh, collaborate uh, or contribute to a number of organizations that are currently building standards, audit frameworks, uh, or doing research on the policy side, uh, policy and regulation side. So between those three focuses. You've covered most of the things. So I would be curious to know, you mentioned about embedding yourself in the developer community or the teams. Have you ever gotten pushback because the developer community, data science community, engineering community is very closely knit and they usually give a lot of pushback to people who are not in that community. Um, for example, even stakeholders sometimes when we are running agile sprints and I'm a developer by trade, engineer by trade, data practicing data scientist, but I try to look at outside in and I'm unfortunately I've not seen many engineers do that. So have you ever gotten pushed back and, and questioning about the importance of it and how did you deal with that? Um. I get it not so much from the developer teams, but more from C level, C C suit. Uh, Interesting. In of, I think, and that's I think because of uh, like ethics has a uh, um, is 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 a bit of a loaded term, and when you say ethics, uh, you know, a lot of people. My my position is ethics doesn't work. In, in, in a vacuum in itself in the Correct. absence of regulation mm -hmm. uh, but it needs to be there so that, that's my starting point but when you say ethics people uh, in, initial reaction is uh, I'm already doing ethical things you know I'm, I'm already ethical or uh, I don't need to do it uh, I, I'm not like I'm compliant with regulation current regulation or, or stuff etc uh, so the pushback if I can call it pushback is those initial conversations of the rationale or the mm -hmm. case for ethics, uh, you know, why you should embed this in the in, in, into your products or services, etc. So it's a bit of a back and forth conversation at the beginning, but uh, once we're once, once we're on the same page, um, and it's really about that, it's really explaining that uh, properly. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, sh show showcasing the consequences for the companies as well. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that's a startup or an established company, because uh, at the end of the day, people I would like to believe uh, people don't do it. Most of the people don't do it uh, with evil intent. Right, uh, right. It's just like that... being exposed to the consequences, understanding those better. So. No, exactly. Sometimes it's that second degree consequences, yeah. right? When Facebook was created nobody thought about the second degree consequences or even Twitter for that matter and content moderation, which is a big deal today. Um, that's awesome. So, so I know you've been working for a few years, so you're ahead of the curve in terms of ethics and AI and how to evaluate it. What do you see um, the trends or what are some practical things happening in evaluating ethics of artificial intelligence applications? to this year and, and in the next maybe couple years that you can think about? Uh, I think the, 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 you know, there's a lot of talk of legislation or regulation in, in especially in like further regulation in Europe, but also in different uh, countries across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of, um, trying to get ready or get into a better shape uh, mm -hmm. with your products, your process, your life cycle uh, for an, imp you know, uh, future regulation. Um, and the companies still, you know, uh, not that I'm bad mouthing risk management. I think that the risk management has a big impact and like a, a good impact on things. Uh, but it's still on that uh, route. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the incoming administration, you know, the new administration in US, uh, the new regulations, the draft regulations in Europe um, that are being discussed. Uh, the focus will be how can we, how, how are we going to comply mm -hmm. with this stuff? And are there, uh, 
uh, automated ways or algorithmic ways to help us comply with this stuff. Um, I, I think that there will be a lot of governance um, methods, different governance methods, products, companies uh, coming in. Uh, but I also think, uh, you know, maybe not in the first few months, not first couple of months, I think that's that's not that might not be the priority. Uh, but I think in the first year of the administration, we're going to see more coming out of the, the likes of FTC, FCC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Consumer Protection Bureau, uh, and the likes, um, as well as DOD. And, you know, it will be interesting to see how uh, all those come together. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that since I'm working closely here in Washington, D.C., with some of these agencies that you mentioned, and it's interesting to see the maturity model and conversations that are happening around ethical implications of AI systems and applications. So I think you're doing an amazing job. So any, any last words to organizations who would like to know more about how to evaluate the ethical implications of AI systems? Uh, I think it definitely starts before you even come to evaluating uh, the building that capacity as is the first step. Um, you know, not putting this, putting the onus or the responsibility on, on one single person, but looking at how can we get everyone to think about it. What, how can we put in spaces and tools inside the organization to raise these concerns? Uh, you know, I I always say like whistleblower whistleblowing is usually the nuclear option mm -hmm. there should be good practices good mechanisms inside the organizations to raise concerns uh critically and comfortably discuss the uh, concerns you know companies should really look into one how to build like i said how to build the capacity inside the organizations and second how to look at all the mechanisms you know, not only the product that you're putting together, yeah. you're creating, mm -hmm. you know, not only the life cycle or development, uh, you know, uh, ML dev uh, life cycles, but looking at the company in, in uh, from a wider perspective. Uh, so evaluation comes after, after, after that, uh, really, you know, you, you need to be, you need to know what you're looking at, you need to align your, all of your policies, procedures and methods. Uh, and then start looking at uh, start looking at that, but hopefully sooner rather than later. Right. No, absolutely. No, this was really good. I know this was a brief conversation, but I really appreciate your inputs. And I'm going to drop links to your website and your social media handles and the YouTube channel as well as on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time today, Marva, and have a great day. You too. Thank you Bye. for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.